Hello, and welcome to another episode of Hacking with Friends. Today, I have my coworker Killian on, and he is going to show us what happens when someone who is trusted on a Windows network is able to get in and start doing some sneaky Active Directory stuff to find credit card information, which is a pretty big deal if a malicious insider gets into your network. Killian, thank you for joining us today. Hey, Cody. Thanks for having me today. I'm really excited to, uh, to walk through this with you. So this is pretty spicy because a lot of different businesses use Windows and they have lots of employees and most businesses also don't lock down access to files. So in the average business that's not you know, taking any steps to make sure employees don't have access to stuff they're not supposed to, it's probably pretty easy for them to move around and maybe discover stuff or have access to stuff that they're not supposed to. So is that kind of what this attack is exploiting fundamentally? Yeah, absolutely. So in a lot of businesses, um, people tend to be over-provisioned. So if you think about when you join a company, um, at least in the corporate world, you're typically given some type of profile or role when you join, and you're granted some subset of, of data and access. A lot of times what happens is they might clone maybe a template or, hey, you know, you're joining the accounting team. Bob in accounting uh, has been here forever. He has exactly what you need. Let's just clone his profile. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, on day one, um, depending on the business, sometimes folks have more access than really they need, especially joining the organization. And as you move around in your career, it's typically additive. A lot of organizations say, hey, you're working on a project. Here's access to these, uh, this resource. You're on this special team. Here's access to some more stuff. You're helping out this other team. We need to get access to their data. So as you work at a place um, long enough, you tend to collect permissions and um, access to things. And oftentimes it's not always revoked, especially in the file system. If you have IAM, right, unless you do like something that. wrong or like you know get in trouble, like people don't usually right. just come at you to take away your file permissions as a matter of like you know normal review. It's usually like, hey, you messed up, like we're you're off this project, and then you would get your permissions revoked because most people don't see that as I guess the threat, even when you know the. I'll I'll give a personal example. So yeah. I was um, hired on as a contractor for a Fortune 500 company, uh, like a big tech company and they excluded contractors from all of their internal meetings with employees. But they also gave contractors uh, access to the minutes in Google mm -hmm. Docs for those meetings. So this whole theater went out of, oh, you guys can't see this information. But at the same time, the required reading was right next to the document that <laughs> had all the information we weren't supposed to see. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of organizations that you know will sign you up, get you started, and then kind of forget about you know the levels of access you have and what kind of information you have access to. And for a malicious actor, like someone who's maybe looking at going to another company, maybe they're behind on bills, they want to make some extra money on cybercrime, that extra access could be you know really potentially interesting to them mm -hmm. if there's an easy way for them to find it. Absolutely. And that's what I want to kind of walk through today. We have a couple different examples here. The first one I'll walk through is a really basic um, PowerShell script. Um, you know, PowerShell's really cool, really powerful. If um, I, I bet a lot of the audience here is at least familiar with it. I mean, if you're not, it's Bash, but on Windows, sort of, kind of, or Ruby <laughs> on Windows, more or less, if, if you want to go that, uh, down that route. Um, but everything's kind of treated like an object in Windows here. So uh, we can get commands we can run. Um, queries on the data that we get back and the objects that we get back. So uh, the first one I'll do in, um, is just kind of pop up on my screen. I'll open PowerShell. Mm. Um, right now, I'm just going to do it as a regular old user. Let's for right now assume that uh, maybe I am an admin, maybe I'm not an admin, but I'm going to do it as a regular old user. So I'm logged into my PowerShell here. Um, a lot of times in the corporate world, at least, we have certain you know, map drives. So your local Windows Server, you know, NAS device, whatever it happens to be, might be mapped already. Um, in this case, I won't go through the phases of not knowing, so I'm not going to be an attacker or an outside person. I already know my main corporate file share, um, file server. Um, what I'm going to do here is I just pulled up my notepad because typing is not interesting. <laughs> so I'm just going to copy my command here. What I'm just going to do is map a new drive. So I might have this mapped already. Um, this is just the main uh, share. I'm going to map it. So now I have a Q drive mapped on my machine, hmm. treated as a, a local um, drive. Uh, I can do this in different ways. It just makes the code a little bit simpler if I do it as a local drive as opposed to a network drive when I do this mapping here. But I also have my get child item command in PowerShell. So what this is going to do is I'm going to give it a path and say the finance folder. I happen to know that's there. Now I could do this on the entire you know file share. I can do it on the NAS, anywhere else that I want to. Um, I'm limiting it to just my finance folder right now for the sake of the demo. Um, 
So what it's going to do is it's going to just return any of the items within there, so the child items. Uh, I'm going to do it recursive, so it's going to traverse all the way down. And in this case, I'm only kind of concerned about um, file items here. I don't care about folders. You can't you know, extract text out of, well, you can't extract <laughs> file names out of folders, but you know what I mean. And in this case, uh, for the sake of demo, I'm only going to do, uh, include text files. Um, well, another, just out of curiosity, yeah. can you look for other types of files that might include like personal identifiable information, like, um, like PDFs and stuff like that, too? Uh, yeah, you can include whatever you want. As long as you can extract the text or it can read it, um, you can include whatever you want. You might get some weird stuff if it's uh, you know, a package or binary type um, when you're looking at it. But as long as there's text data in there and it can pull it out, you can run this on anything. Cool. Um, and then, again, this is just the traversal. So what this is going to re uh, do is just return objects of you know, text type. Um, in this, and then I'm going to pipe it right over to my select string. So, Cody, I know you're a Linux expert. This should look pretty familiar uh, to you in this case. My favorite way to spend my weekend, a uh, regex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Writing a good regex to find the exact right piece of information is hard. Yes. But I can tell that this is looking for some very specific types of numbers in a very specific format. Yep. Yeah, so just piping that right into a select string command here, and then you can uh, give it a, reg a regex argument. Um, in this case, I believe this is looking for a visa number or, or some different variants of visa numbers. So in this case, um, total of 15 digits uh, begin with a 4, 5, or 6, and then 0 through 9 for the rest of them. Um, or so I mean, another numbers. equally plausible scenario could be something like uh, you know, social security numbers mm -hmm. if this was a medical provider or, or something like that. Just personally, personally identifiable information that could be used for fraud or otherwise could you know, be uh, useful to a criminal or someone who is looking at stealing that information. Hmm. Yep, exactly. I mean, I could use, um, in this case, I'm using regular expressions. I could use keywords. I could use pretty much anything I could stick in here. I'm just basically doing a, a string match in this case. Um, and then this is just same pattern, just broken out with either dash or space delimiters um, if, uh, if it's written differently here. So uh, real easy one. I'm not actually sure if there's anything that will match this uh, in this particular um, lab. I use this uh, just to just to test out things. This is kind of my go-to. It's a really noisy um, item because it's looking at every single thing. Uh, so it'll turn up a lot of um, a lot of access. It's not particularly stealthy in this case. So if someone were doing uh, monitoring access to files, which most companies you know may not be doing, then this would really leave a big fingerprint that somebody was trying to access all this data and that it was uh, like at the very least being searched through, if not right. actually directly accessed. Yeah. So if you were monitoring this, something like this. Um, would definitely look like automated behavior. It's not a person. Um, you know, when you're think about when you're browsing your you know, your home drive or looking for that file you need. Um, if even if you're not sure, you might click around and there's some pause in between the accesses. So when you open it and it loads and you look through the document, go, oh, this is not what I want. I'll go to the next one. This is going to happen in rapid succession, mm. um, pretty much as fast as it can open it, read through it, um, and do the text matching. So it's going to be very quick, theoretically speaking. I mean, if they're this is limited text documents, so it's going to be a little bit faster because it um, hopefully it's the text excluding small. most other file yeah. types, right? But it's still going to be very quick if you're monitoring this. So let's go ahead and fire this guy off and just see what we turn up. I'm not actually sure what's in there right now. Looks like some stuff's happening. Yep. Interesting. So here we go. So there's some data in there uh, in this case. Um, so intangible assets, uh, I think that's, the, I believe this is the line number, if I'm not mistaken. And then here's the, uh, I think the string that we're matching here. So Interesting. Um, so potentially, see, based on the context of where this is being stored on the drive, I, you know, if I was running this search, would probably conclude that this was some sort of way of storing credit card information, or, you know, if it matched up to that format, at right. least want to take another closer look at it. Absolutely. And in this case, I wasn't being stealthy or porting it out. This is just writing right to the terminal here. So I can just quickly look at it and match it. If I was doing this um, in real life, I'd probably pipe this out to a text file or something else. You're not going to sit here and scroll through all this. But <laughs> in this case, it looks like the finance reports in corporate 2006, Q1, intangibles, looks like is where the good stuff is at. Um, mm. Credit memo so that... report. <laughs> Right, so as an attacker now, I basically have looked at the access I have, and rather than having to go through every individual thing myself, I've just used a script to identify all the interesting places where juicy stuff is stored. And right. aside from the things I've matched, there might be other stuff in these stores as well, which I can now investigate because I'm aware that this involves sensitive information. Absolutely. And you know, the next thing would be, you know, I can just go to this share, I can browse to it, 
um, and just validate this manually if I wanted to. Or, yeah, this is pretty good. You know, maybe I'll grab this folder. It looks like there's a lot of hits here, and I'll just deal with it later. Uh, if I don't want to spend the time of looking at it manually now, I can just, again, um, run a copy command or just manually go and browse it um, in Windows if I want to. So on Windows, I mean, provided someone has permission set to allow them to you know, be a part of this entire share, it seems like there's not really, there's barely any hacking here. Really, we're yep. just automating our, ac their, our unnecessary access to the share right. in order to be able to dig through stuff that you know, the average employee might not know exists. But you know, by just adding a script to, to exploit that access, mm -hmm. we can suddenly just see everything there. Right. Hmm. Um, and that kind of leads me to the next point that I want to make is, so again, if they're monitoring, if someone's watching this access, this is me, I'm logged in as myself doing mm -hmm. this. Uh, pretty obvious, right? Uh, <laughs> someone's watching and go, hey, wait a minute, Killian, what do you think you're doing? Um, <laughs> I'm going to get that phone call, and they're not going to be super thrilled about, about whatever it is I'm, uh, I'm doing over here. Right, or if in a couple of weeks, you know, it gets known that there's a right. credit card breach or they start having unauthorized charges on certain cards, mm -hmm. they're going to go back and be like, who's the, who's the guy from marketing that's been mm -hmm. in the finance department, like touching all these files. Mm -hmm. mm. So what what I would want to do, and in this case, you know, let's pretend that I'm a I'm a savvy attacker here. Um, I want to do this as somebody else. I mean, and there are plenty of other ways to get credentials. Um, I could walk around. Well, if we were still in the office, I could walk around and shoulder surf some credentials or look for the old sticky note next to the monitor. Um, or and we'll, we'll get to this, but uh, I could look for maybe on like have I been pwned or something like that if um, any corporate uh, emails were part of another breach maybe I could get a reused password something like that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I know Cody yeah. I, that's a big thing for I watched you did uh, some recon about that actually oh absolutely I mean sometimes these breach passwords will just get all aggregated to the massive password list so I did I found one that was like 20 gigabytes or something and did it for a, a video we featured and I was able to get my mom's old passwords four of them <laughs> And I was just like, wow, that one has curse words in it. Like, my mom's spicier than I thought. Uh, but what was interesting was this information is out there. So if someone is reusing passwords, I mean, if you can track that person down, mm -hmm. you know, these passwords are not a secret anymore. Even, you know, my right. passwords, which are fairly complicated, like, are out there too. And if I can't be reusing them. So, yeah, once you identify that a password has been breached, you have a dedicated attacker can go out there and find the source of, uh, of the data dump and actually go through these themselves if they want to. And I actually know of companies, legal or illegal, uh, who aggregate this information mm -hmm. and sell it um, to anybody who's looking for it. So uh, there's lots of different ways that this can be abused. And, and getting passwords from third parties, uh, or especially third-party data breaches that you have mm -hmm. no control over, um, that is increasingly get, becoming a popular way that attackers gain access to these systems. Not just attackers. People who are uh, investigating things legally also have access to this information. Right. Um, so yeah, uh, the, and the data is definitely out there to support these kinds of attacks. Yeah, so, so if I wanted to be you know, real tricky about it, that's certainly one way to go about it. Um, being an insider and being kind of trusted on this network, I have some other options as well. Now, Cody, I'll put you on the spot here a little bit. Uh, what, what account, like if you could breach, you know, aside from domain admin, right, um, what account do you think might have a lot of access uh, uh, to a lot of the data that we have here? Um, which Roots. one would you maybe go after? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> but I'm from I'm from Linux, so <laughs> you have to understand. But I would say like a domain administrator or domain yeah. controller or, or something something with important words strung together in a compound fashion. I, I feel like would probably <laughs> be there my best bet. Mm -hmm. The one of the ones that I would go after, and this is uh, you know what I'm going to show you in a second here is. Um, maybe like a backup type account. Uh, mm, like by, an automated or a system account. Exactly. Got so it. by default, backups tend to have maybe a little more access depending on how it's set up. Um, well, importantly, I would say also automated behavior is expected right. on machine accounts. So like if you're doing you know, what you're doing and it looks super suspicious for a person, having it being run under a machine account, um, at least like the automated behavior is more expected because it's right. supposed to be like an automated process. Yep, exactly. So yeah, that, that's exactly it. Let's let's see if we can find you know service account or something that they can exploit here. So let me close this down. Uh, and what I'm going to do is we have a couple um, scripts already written here um, that'll walk kind of through through the process. Um, so the first one here is I'll launch my uh, Kerber roasting script. Let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger so we can see it. Thank you. 
So while you're doing that, um, I had to learn this myself because, again, I'm from Linux. So Kerber Roasting was a little bit new to me. But on these Windows networks, it's possible to do certain types of attacks that, as Killen was explaining to me, uh, focus on downgrading and using known um, known components of the hash to basically make them a lot easier to break. So we can take powerful encryption and downgrade it to be much more vulnerable by taking advantage of things that are still supported, you know, legacy things that might not be as strong anymore but still want to be included. Uh, so old systems can be used or old computers don't have to be updated. Um, we can use those as hackers to basically use the weakest possible version mm -hmm. of security that's supported by a system. Yep, that's it. If you got that old, you know, NT4 system plugged in somewhere doing something, uh, you still got to maintain backwards compatibility. And you know, Windows is great for that if you have those legacy systems, but you're also, uh, you know, have that potential to to have it used against you. Hmm. So in this case, um, with my script, what it's going to do is it's going to look uh, in Active Directory. It's going to, you know, just do a bit, pretty standard Active Directory call and say, hey, return anything with um, a service principal name or an SPN. Basically. Uh, anything that's running a service um, or can run a service. And this is all, this script is doing it, but this is really basic information. Um, and when you want to interact with the service, you talk to you know Active Directory and you get this information. So this is not secret, it's not a trick. This is basic, just this is how Windows works and how you uh, interact with um, different things running services in the uh, in the domain, so. Got it. Um, so in this case, again, really, really quick uh, list here. So here's all the accounts that have uh, SPN values in here. So, um, you know, in a big corporate environment, you might have a lot of them. So a lot of stuff makes, you know, makes sense. You know, backup service, the SQL service, running my databases, uh, my, you know, file server services here, VPN services. Uh, this is all pretty standard common type of stuff. Nothing here mm -hmm. should be super, uh, super shocking. Um, but what I want to do is, so now that I have all of these, I want to dump all of those service tickets. Again, um, just, to, you know, this is standard practice. So, hey, Active Directory, I'd like to interact with this service. Could you please um, provide me the ticket to do that? Mm -hmm. uh, we're just going to do that, you know, in an automated fashion. And behind the scenes, you can use, like, um, Mimikatz and things like that to, to do this for you. And that's what's actually happening um, in the background cool. and here. If anybody is perking up at the mention of Mimikatz, then if you, uh, yeah, uh, we're not really showing too much of it, but it's basically a tool that's able to go into Windows memory and extract values. Um, and there are some versions of Windows now that encrypt this information, so not all versions of Windows are vulnerable to this, but there are a lot of, um, of versions that do not. So that's kind of what we're taking advantage in terms of being able to extract information just from memory. Yep, exactly. And again, here's an example. I'll see if you can see the, um, it was run as a, as a process. But again, here's an example of that. Um, you know, here's my you know, take, granting ticket information. Um, and basically, it just took that and dumped it all out in two files here. Mm. You can see that in the background. So here's all of that information dumped out into uh, into um, files in this case. The nice thing with this is, since I've dumped them now, I don't have to necessarily interact with um, the domain controller anymore at this point. So I can take this offline, and I can take as much time as I need to crack these. Um, Interesting. Okay, so this is like grabbing a, like a Wi-Fi handshake for me, where as soon yep. as you have that hash, you can just go somewhere else and just crack it and take as much time as you want. Um, right. And the suspicious activity is over, essentially, right. or at least it, it's reduced, uh, because you can take your next step in a way that's not going to be you know, going and attempting to crack everything live. You're doing right. it all offline. Yep, that's exactly. Sneaky. Pretty tricky. Um, yeah, as opposed to a brute force, which is, again, a really, really noisy attack, it's, it's kind of... I don't want to equate them because it's not technically the same thing, but it's the same type of principles. Hey, you're trying to basically guess the password more or less yeah. um, at that point, but I can do it offline. So in order to not waste uh, our time, again, we have a lot of tickets here. Um, there, that list was pretty big of, of things with SPNs. I only want to go after the ones that are going to get me what I need. And we talked about the domain admins group. So again, this is pretty standard stuff. You can uh, just ask Active Directory more or less for a list of who's in your domain admins group. <laughs> so in this case, I have my backup service account, IT admin, and my uh, proxy user here, or my proxy mm. account. Uh, pretty interesting. So, thinking, Go ahead. so I was just saying, thinking from the perspective of attacker, um, there's one of those that kind of makes sense because it would have a lot of access to files, act in an automated way, and generally be like immune from the kind of suspicion that might be levied at these other two accounts. Right, exactly. Good old, good old backup service here. So, um, 
yeah, this is this is going to be the one that again I would I would pick um, to to go after. So just as you mentioned here, what we're going to do is um, we're going to use this uh, basically as an input here to decide to you know which one we're going to brute force. Um, and so here we go. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see. It pops up a new window because it just asked me which one I want to pick. So mm -hmm. just going back and forth, uh, I know from my two lists comparing them, the backup service is the one that I want. So I'm just going to say it. OK here. And it'll take a second. Cool. And this should also be a familiar program for people who like cracking. At this point, we're doing a pretty standard hash cracking attack where yep. we're trying to compare a big list of potential passwords against a hash that we managed to know what the process is to generate that hash. So provided the method that to generate the hash is known, we can speed up this process just using our computer's processing power or GPU and be able to hopefully extract the password pretty quickly. Yep, exactly. And in this case, um, part of what you talked about is uh, to get these, I believe in this system here, um, we did that encryption downgrade. And I think we're looking for basically the uh, NTLM hash. So mm -hmm. a, an old, old hash still around, but not real good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, every time I see a WEP Wi-Fi network, I'm like, this is a trap. <laughs> but I mean, they're still used in real places. Mm -hmm. In Los Angeles, I've actually seen them connected to traffic networks. So there's still hardware out there using these old stuff, and it just—it's crazy, but it's still around. Oh, you gotta—you gotta love it. Oh no, my favorite password. It's a—it's a real good one. Come on, it meets all of the criteria. <laughs> it's got a special character. It's got a number there. <laughs> you can't tell me this isn't secure. <laughs> you know, this is. This is what we tell our, you know, our grandmas. You know, you got to make them them passwords with the special characters. It follows and all the rules, and of course, we're just gonna be like, you see, where you messed up was you didn't make the the P a capital P. Oh. Then it's gonna meet all the requirements. Dang it. Oh. Yeah. See, better luck next time. Backup <laughs> service. <laughs> um, so again, real easy. So there we go. Now we have the the password for our backup service account. So. Uh, pretty pretty easy here. If I wanted to, I could you know run my script again uh, and look for that um, type of information. But in this case, um, I actually have a, a different, a better script that's a little bit more visually uh, pleasing to um, leverage this information. So now that I got my password here, I'm gonna go ahead and close out of that. I got my uh, my file crawler PowerShell script. In this case, it's just prompting me for credentials. So. Hopefully I typed that in right. There we go. Cool. Didn't. So we're executing this as the account that we just entered, so the one that we just got the password for? Uh, yep. If I if I would have typed my oops. If I would type my credentials right. Backup service. It's real small on my screen too. <laughs> Maybe. There we go. Yeah. OK. Uh, so in this case, again, this is just a, a prettier uh, version of, of what I did. In this case, it's just asking for a keyword. But again, I could run this. I could, you know, um, I could put in a regex when I wrote the script. Um, mm. In this case, I'm just going to look for a keyword. As I mentioned, PowerShell is really quite flexible with this. You can put in pretty much anything you want. And at this point now, not only are we using a fancier script, we're also using a administrator profile that is automated, so this mm -hmm. behavior isn't going to be as suspicious uh, to basically do the dirty work for us. So it's those fingerprints are going to be on all these files and all this access, not that of the account we were actually assigned by this company. Yep, exactly. Mm. Make that a little bit bigger so we can see what it's up to. Again, targeting the uh, the same location, share finance in this case, a little bit, a little bit more pleasing to look at. We have our doc names up here instead of just dumping them out. Mm. And I'm just looking for anything that says confidential. Ah, a good choice. So found words, and there we go, confidential. Uh, Perfect. And ahead. some of these are, oh, no, they all look like um, Word documents. Yep, these are Word documents in this particular case. So easy enough to go through and grab that. Um, so in this case, this script automates a little bit of the process for me. You know, 
I don't know if I'd call it being lazy, but let's just call it being efficient. I don't want to have to copy <laughs> the files myself and zip them up and everything else. So let the script do it for me. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and let it continue. Uh, I'm going to copy into my local uh, drive. And then you know what? You know, my company's pretty sophisticated. I know that they have some, um, uh, some defenses, some email protection here. So I'm going to encrypt these. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and be a little bit tricky here. Uh, I know that um, the email system is, if I just threw it in the body, it would probably regex that and say, hey, why are you sending out all this confidential information? But I'm going to zip it up here. I'm just going to give it a, a password. I'm going to call it the Clever. password Inception. One. Maybe password 12. Oh, Who would ever have thought about that? <laughs> it's a lot of brute forcing to get from, you know. Password 1 to password 1, 2. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so... You know, that's uh, that's my security background right there. I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> give, it, give it the old college try. <laughs> so, okay, so at this point, even if the company that we were working with was a bit more sophisticated and they mm -hmm. were monitoring access and they, you know, were maybe really interested in who was accessing these files, you might not even have access to these files. Uh, right. if, if you're only, let's say that you were restricted and you were in a different department mm -hmm. and you didn't know that these files existed, you would be able to get access to them using a right. completely different set of fingerprints and also elevated privileges from by mm -hmm. being able to basically hijack this account by cracking the password. Yep, that's exactly it. Um, and th this is the case again. Um, the, the first example there, I had access to that information I was running under my profile. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in marketing, right? So I mm. eh, probably shouldn't have had access in the first place. That seems like uh, maybe there's an everyone group or a global group on there. Maybe I was just, you know, misprovisioned, but probably shouldn't have had access in the first place. And <laughs> in a lot of cases, uh, those global groups really get you. They're, they're out there. Um, they're default in a lot of cases. So a lot of people have access to a lot of stuff they probably shouldn't or don't need to. Uh, in this case, this is um, going after maybe a slightly more hardened target, someplace that has it locked down. Uh, I'm not a member of that, let's pretend, the, the finance team, so I'm locked out of that. But again, I'm getting around that uh, in this case. Sneaky. And again, That's very sneaky. Yeah. And we're doing with, again, as you mentioned, the backup account where eh, backup accounts probably going and touching all this stuff. Uh, if you're not looking real close at it, um, you know, in this case, uh, you know, figure backup account probably runs off business hours and things like that. So there are, you know, some idiosyncrasies, but, you know, unless you're looking for this, could get lost, could get lost in your SIM or something like that too. Mm. So in this case, I'm all done with this. I'm all zipped up here. That's, here so that's pretty amazing because most companies, you know, eventually they get to the point where they realize that their their personal information they have of their customers needs to be protected from internal employees who might misuse it. Like that's, you know, everybody has some incident where that happens once you accumulate enough data, there have to be rules. But, you know, being suspicious of your own infrastructure and like being aware that like your infrastructure can mm -hmm. be hijacked fairly easily, like that's that's a whole other level of being able to respond to this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Because once it starts kicking off and it really, you know, that person realizes that they have access to this sort of account that has, you know, basically unrestricted access to the entire mm -hmm. domain, they could really do a lot of damage. And it, it's difficult for a company who understands that, you know, an employee's account might need to be monitored or locked down to make the transition mm -hmm. into my, <laughs> my backup account might start acting in ways mm -hmm. that, you know, I don't want it to just because some IT person happened to set a bad password when they weren't thinking. Right. And that's, and that's one of those, you know, real, you know, I've worked in, in corporate uh, IT and corporate security um, for a, a while prior to joining Fornoris, and I, I don't want to, to, you know, make anybody feel bad. This could be just, you know, a real simple error that could happen. Hey, I was testing something, I was having a problem with my backup account, um, wasn't able to access something, was doing some troubleshooting, threw it in the domain admins group just to, just to test it to see if it could get into this folder it was having access problems with, maybe the ACL was, was messed up forgot to take it out and started working again, or it started working and I never thought about it. Um, and then you have this kind of hidden vulnerability, again, to just comparing that list of um, accounts with SPNs and hmm. the accounts that are in domain admins group. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's not malicious. Again, it could be one of those simple things that's lurking in there, just how it's built, so. Yeah, it's just an accident. And right. anybody who can discover that there's access to this thing within the network then can use it to either dig deeper or do something that the person who set it up never intended for that account right. to be able to do. Wow. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, I say this all the time, this is really security through obscurity. 
Mm. So you just hope they don't find it, and you know, it's you, sometimes you talk to people and they go, "Well, it's never happened before." The, no, the question it's I never happened is, that you caught anyone doing. You've never had right. an incident. You right. just that's that's what could be safely said. We've never had an incident. Not that it's never happened before, but. Right. Yeah, it's. I mean, my previous story, as an example, is just lots of employees are presented with information that they do mm -hmm. not need, and most of them just ignore it because it's not part of their job. But for the percentage of employees that are going to be, you know, maybe testing the limits to what their access is, I mean, this was two pretty surprising levels mm -hmm. of how it can be done. First, just taking the access you're actually given by the company and just crawling through it in an automated way. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if you're not given any access at all, you can still take advantage of small mistakes that somebody else made and identify accounts that can give you greater access to the entire system, completely bypassing the attempt to lock down your account in the first place. Right. So it seems like there's just a lot of different ways that companies can go wrong uh, just to make an attacker with a, even a, a relative amount of knowledge or at least the ability mm -hmm. to, to maybe Google something uh, right. to be able to break through some of these defenses built into the system. Right. And just even, you know, I'm I'm a big proponent of just making it just that much of a pain enough to dissuade most of the casual uh, looky loos, I guess, mm. and just keeping it locked down, keeping people in the right groups, you know, revoking access. It's if you're not in the habit of doing that now, it's a real easy defense. I mean, think about um, you can see it here, and we're not going to go over it in this particular video, but you know, a ransomware simulator acts in the exact same way. You, you know, you get somebody who clicks on ransomware and infects your machine, uh, even if it's just running on your, your local thing, going out to whatever map drives you have, it's doing the exact same process. Hey, where do you have access? Where do you have access? Oh, you have access to all these places? Encrypted. Then you're in Interesting. So theoretically, mm -hmm. anybody that has this access could click on a malware file and everything we just yep. showed that applies to a malicious insider could actually just apply to a piece of ransomware. And the same sort of access could be exploited by a more sophisticated piece of malware that's just running on that person's account. Absolutely. I mean, I could. I, we won't. We won't do it here. Maybe this is a, an idea for another video. But yeah, I'll go back through, good. rewrite my script here, and instead of just uh, taking this information, any files that I find output here, pipe them into something else, hmm. copy them because I want to. I want to hold it for. You know, I want this information anyway. But uh, pipe it into a new file. You know, encrypt it or do something to it. <laughs> Change the extension. You know, real. Real low, low power uh, ransomware, um, <laughs> but I mean it's it's real easy. We can we can run through that um, pretty straightforward. Yeah, yeah. So really, with this level of access, you have a lot to worry about. What is what is the best way of fixing this for companies that are worried about somebody breaking into their stuff just by having a password set wrong or having a domain account that's just been left and forgotten? If they have a lot of hands maybe on the system or, or a lot of people that are touching this who might not be accountable. Right. Uh, with what they're doing. Um, so just again, just going back through knowing where you have those global groups on the file system is the first thing. If you can just get rid of them, you're going to be a, a million times um, better off from mm -hmm. just the casual people. Now, if you have some of these misconfigurations, as I mentioned, this information's out there. You know, I wrote, uh, I didn't write the, the Kerber roasting script, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, we could look at the, the script in this particular case, but you can run these queries against Active Directory. The information's out there. You can dump it to a spreadsheet and you can go rooting around and this type of stuff. Um, mm. Now, if you had an easier, better way to automate this, um, there are a lot of great solutions out there. I won't name drop any, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I think we can all guess which one I would recommend. Mm. Um, that will surface this information, and not just kind of this type of stuff, but there's a lot of, I mean, anybody who, who administers Active Directory knows it, it is crazy complicated under the hood. There's a lot going on. It's really powerful, but the more powerful it gets, the more complicated that it gets, the more stuff that's in there. Um, mm -hmm. I actually was on a webinar a couple weeks ago, and uh, uh, I had somebody call me out that I wasn't um, specific and factually correct with the way I described something in Active Directory. And hey, I appreciate that. You know, uh, you know, you never appreciate getting called out live on a webinar, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I was trying to be simple, and and it wasn't 100% accurate. But mm. you know, that's the thing. You have people that live and breathe this. You know, I spend some time in the Active Directory, and I and I know my way around it. But there are people that are like, uh, just geniuses at at knowing the nooks and crannies. And um, there's a lot you can do in there. So being able to uh, make this as easy as possible for um, you know, regular security guys or 
specifically, you know, um, people maybe who have an IT background who say, oh, you know, computers, now you're in security. Um, that are kind of dropped into some of this. Uh, being able to surface this and visualize it and kind of pick out some of these things is really important for, for that first line of defense. Uh, just knowing what you're dealing with is, is the first step in the problem. Right. So to sum things up, for me anyway, I feel like the best ways that you can, as a company, try to address these sorts of problems is, first, of course, as you mentioned, get rid of global accounts, get rid of things that have access to everything, audit who has access to your files, and make sure that if someone were to go rogue or just start clicking on random links that include ransomware, it's not going to nuke a bunch of files that have absolutely right. no benefit being shared with that person. If you don't want to lose those files, potentially, like in a ransomware attack, and it actually doesn't benefit the company to give that person access, there's probably actually no reason for that person to have access in the first place. Mm -hmm. And then the second would be looking for automated or suspicious behavior on your network or from accounts with elevated access. So obviously, if you're able to detect bot-like behavior on your network, that's a good first step, especially if you're looking for things that are sensitive or touching sensitive files, but also having some way of being able to audit system processes and other sorts of unusual access to compare it against like you know what this thing should be doing. There's a lot of different things you can do to try to provide visibility on that. Of course, we can obviously name drop and mention that there are some fantastic ones with Veronis who are sponsoring this live stream. Uh, but really, when it comes to making that information simple enough for a big company that's trying to make money to understand when they're under attack or whether it's just like, you know, like Joe Schmoe's like needs to get into like some accounting files and it's unusual, but it's not that big of a deal because he's just not following the rules. Like it can get definitely get hairy for companies that have a lot of stuff going on. So I'm going to say for small companies, auditing access and making sure that you're just looking for signs of, um, you know, suspicious behavior in your network might be a place to start. But for larger companies, that might not actually be a solution because there might just be too much going on to mm -hmm. rely on, you know, individual alerts that which might just get right. you kind of exhausted past a certain point of, of investigating things that don't actually turn up any real danger. So this is a pretty crazy attack. Like, And because so yeah. many companies use Windows, it's interesting to see how just a small misconfiguration can cause really big problems in terms of keeping information secure. So. I mean, I'm I'm kind of blown away by uh, the fact that some of the attacks that I use against Wi-Fi, which I consider to be grossly insecure, mm -hmm. can also work against misconfigurations and much more sophi sophisticated corporate networks. Absolutely. And the only part that we didn't cover here is just getting the data back out. Um, you know, I have it in my zip file here. Mm -hmm. uh, depending on how locked down my computer is, I could put it in my thumb drive. Maybe that that's locked down. But you know what? You know what's not locked down? Email. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, maybe they're monitoring your corporate file server. Uh, in this case, you know, I'm just going to go out to Gmail. A lot of companies, uh, hey, it's cool. Go ahead and use your personal mail. You know, do whatever you got to do here. So in this case, uh, I'm going to log in. In this case, I I do have a proxy, so I'm going to log in. But you know what? Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to log in. Let backup service do it. Uh, log ah, so even the exfiltration is happening from another service. Yep. That's great. Go and uh, log right into my uh, my backup service account or my email or you know whatever I want to do. Um, but yeah, going to use the proxy here because hey, wait a minute. Um, maybe uh, maybe they're monitoring that or, or looks who like knows. this guy's a serial thief. Look at that. Uh huh. This lots guy's of, stealing information left and right. He there's can't lots stop. Of, lots of good data. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> An email it to you know whoever. Just email it right back to myself. Mm -hmm. Nothing to see here. That seems totally <laughs> relevant. Yeah, yeah. You know, there we go. And uh, as they say, Bob's your uncle. There you go. The least suspicious email <laughs> I've ever seen. <laughs> just an, nothing to see here. Just an encrypted zip file. Yeah, you know, it's just it's private. It says private on there. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's great. Well, okay. So this is not the first time I've heard of Cobra, Kerber roasting, but it's definitely the first time I've seen it demonstrated in this framework, where it is so useful for going after information that honestly looks incredibly juicy. If we're talking mm -hmm. about things like credit card numbers, it doesn't take a genius to figure out how cyber criminals could use something things like credit card numbers. Oh, ab absolutely. I'm gonna get my uh, credit cards. I'm gonna buy some Bitcoin here. Then we're off to the races <laughs> to do some do some really spicy stuff, as you would say. <laughs> yeah. Although you know. 
Then again, this is a lot of work. I had to think about this and get these scripts. I could probably just pay like a, you know, malware as a service vendor. Now that I have some of these bitcoins, uh, mm -hmm. just go ahead and let, let somebody else do it. Go ahead and uh, get that economy of scale. Hire that professional. <laughs> <laughs> Well, just the fact that this can all be automated is really surprising to me. Because if someone really was a malicious actor, then that's kind of exactly mm -hmm. what they could do. They could figure out what they could do manually and then basically find a service account to do it for them and then just script right. everything. And provided, you know, maybe they were doing it after business hours or like right. within the time that that service account was supposed to be running, it would be super hard for a business yep. to be able to figure out what was going on, which is pretty surprising. Right. I mean, and you know, think about this and maybe this is something else we could we can talk about uh, at another time, but building some of this into um, you know, a, a booby trap document or establishing a command and control, get somebody to click on something, do it remotely. I don't even have to be an insider. I have an insider uh, as soon as somebody clicks on something. That's great. So do you guys, if you guys want to see us uh, nuke a virtual machine with ransomware, sound fun. <laughs> Please let us know. We'll do a follow up. Uh, we'll do a follow up live stream where we actually, yeah, take ransomware to a poor Windows network and see what happens uh, when we have more permissions when we actually should. I feel like it's going to be a little bit predictable, but you should see it just, you know, in case it ever happens to you. You're going to want to see it in person to make some decisions about which files to click on before seeing it in real life. So. Cool, cool, cool. Well, thank you for joining us on this episode. I, again, haven't really dove in that much into Windows security stuff, so this has been pretty eye-opening when it comes to the kinds of attacks that can work against some of these more sophisticated networks. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me on today. This was uh, this was really fun. I think we have uh, some pretty cool ideas, but I'm uh, really interested to hear what the uh, the audience you know, is looking for. Me too, me too. And also, if you guys like this content, Veronis has a lot of other really great stuff out there. If you like this recording, you can always see it on the YouTube channel, which is at youtube.com slash security forward. That's security FWD. And also, you should check out the PowerShell Active Directory course. It's a great guide for people who are interested in Windows security, who want to get up and running with scripting and doing other awesome stuff with PowerShell in Active Directory. That's another great resource we highly recommend if you like this. So check all that out. Again, a big thank you to Veronis for making this series possible, and we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Take care.